Um, so I'll jump right in. So uh, we'll be talking about libIGL, which is a prototyping uh, library for geometry processing research in C++. Um, I'm going to take a high level view at the beginning. So I, lately I've been trying to pitch geometry processing rather than a uh, analog of signal processing or image processing that we usually hear. I say, no, geometry processing is actually biology because we are studying the lifetime of a shape. So a shape either exists in the physical world and we scan it, or it's modeled on the computer using 3D modeling software, and then it goes through various stages in its life, analysis and manipulation, deformation, remeshing, uh, things like that, and finally, well, it doesn't die, but it's consumed somehow. It's rendered on the screen or it's 3D printed and the life cycle begins anew. So the stages in between, these analysis and manipulation stages, they involve lots of fundamental core subroutines. So you might have noticed through the talks uh, earlier in today's uh, lectures and also tomorrow and then throughout SGP, a lot of similar pieces will show up all the time. The cotangent Laplacian, solving linear systems. Um, and libIGL is a library of those fundamental subroutines collected in one place with an API that are ready to use for researchers. So we are amassing a large collection of these type of functions. So we have functions for mesh I.O., reading and writing uh, standard representations of surfaces. We have functions for computing quantities locally on a surface. You compute areas, normals, curvatures, edge lengths, adjacencies, and so on. Um, we have implementations of common differential operators, the cotangent Laplacian, the mass matrix, computing gradients and divergence. Um, we can uh, take eig find eigenvalues of those operators. And then we have uh, implemented uh, state-of-the-art and classic high-level operations, like parameterizing a surface mesh onto the plane, or deforming a 3D shape into a new pose, decimating a mesh into a simpler mesh, or smoothing it. We even have some uh, fairly uh, difficult and unique algorithms for, uh, algor uh, for tasks like Boolean operations, so conducting unions and intersections on mesh geometry. We have state-of-the-art uh, quad meshing algorithms, and we have uh, uh, standard uh, accelerated uh, closest point queries. We also link to other popular libraries like the Seagull library, TetGen for tetrahedralization uh, of, of surfaces. Um, and we have bindings in Python and tools for making libIGL useful for those of you that are uh, using MATLAB for your, for your code. Um, and much, much more. So today will be seen as sort of a tour of the uh, motivation behind our library and also some of the core features and hot new features um, that libIGL has to offer. So our mission at libIGL is to empower geometry processing research. And our library is currently in use uh, all across industry and academic research. Daniela and I were discussing um, that this is really a, a very poor subset of the, uh, the institutions that are using our, our code. And if you are using libIGL already, or if you do end up using libIGL, please let us know, because it's useful for us to have a list of, of uh, places that are are finding this useful. Um, and I say that our emphasis on empowering research, and I don't want to make this uh, a strict point that we're not trying to develop a library uh, for app development. So this isn't a toolkit for making the next iPhone app. This is really designed first and foremost for researchers like yourselves, for PhD students and for academic labs. Um, this uh, course today uh, will be largely based off of a tutorial that Daniela and I started writing in 2014 and have been updating continuously. And you can find that off of the libIGL uh, homepage. You can also just search libIGL tutorial. It'll be uh, the first hit. Um, but this is a place that you might want to go after today's course and find out more uh, about different features that we didn't cover today. So I briefly like to introduce uh, myself and the other speaker today. So I'm Alec Jacobson. I'm an assistant professor at University of Toronto. Um, Daniela and I started working together uh, back when he visited uh, NYU as a PhD student, but now he's there as an assistant professor. Um, and Daniela will be giving uh, 
the other half of the talk today. Um, but LibIGL is really a community effort at this point. So we have lots of people contributing uh, code on a pretty regular basis. We wanted to call out James Joe and Sebastian Koch, who are uh, contributing quite a lot recently to LibIGL. So I want to give a special shout out to them. Um, but we also have other regular contributors. And you could be a contributor if you uh, would like to be. All right, so the organization for today, um, I will continue talking a little bit about the motivation of LibIGL, what we use as our core uh, data structures and API, and how we sort of organize the library. Um, then Daniele will give a uh, tour through the tutorial, sort of hitting on uh, topics uh, uh, that he's pulled out uh, for the tutorial and do some live coding and demoing uh, uh, of those topics. We'll have a short break. Uh, then Daniele will return and talk about how to get up and running, how to start a new project in LibIGL and, and code something up from scratch. Um, and then finally, Daniele will show uh, some coding tips and the hot new features that we've added since the last time uh, we presented LibIGL at SGP. And finally, I'll close with an open source grad level course on geometry processing that I've built off of LibIGL and point how you can uh, solve these homeworks in your spare time uh, after the course. All right, without further ado, let's talk about data structures and style. So not surprisingly, the most common object that we're dealing with in geometry processing is a surface, 3D surface. And we want to work with this 3D surface on the computer, so we need some way of discretizing this. So hopefully, um, throughout today, we've become familiar with a very standard way of discretizing a surface on the computer, which is the triangle mesh. So we're going to find lots of points, we'll call them vertices on the surface, and we'll connect them together with triangles. It'll give us connectivity information on the surface. So how do we actually store this on the computer? In LibIGL, we take a very simple approach. So every vertex has three coordinates, x, y, and z. I moved to Canada, so now I've learned to say Z. But sometimes the Canadian students, they also say Z, so they're really confusing me. Um, all right, so vertex one has X1, Y1, Z1. Vertex two has X2, Y2, Z2, and this continues. We populate a list of N vertices, and we can store this in a matrix, an N by three matrix of the coordinates. And this matrix will store real numbers for all intents and purposes. So on the computer, we'll store these as floating point, number, uh, floating point numbers, but we can think of these as storing real. So they're storing real numbers in an n by 3 matrix that we'll call V. Three vertices make up a triangle. And we can store that triangle or facet or face as a triplet of indices into our vertex list. And the order will be important. So here I've written 1, 3, 2, which is a standard convention uh, for counterclockwise ordering that tells us which way, if we curl our hand, we get the normal direction. So the order, the order of this triplet will matter. Um, we can continue doing this. We have one face, two faces, three faces, and so on. And we can store this in an M by 3 matrix. So we have M faces, M triangles, of indices into our vertex list. We'll call this matrix F. So in LibIGL, we base our data structures off of Eigen, which is a uh, pretty popular C++ library for doing linear algebra and for storing uh, raw matrices like this. And the typical thing you'll see in, uh, in our code is a matrix like this for the vertices and a matrix like that for the faces. So here you have for the vertices, you said it's a matrix of reals. So we're storing doubles, double floating point precision numbers. And for the faces, we're storing integers, because those are going to be in indices into our vertex uh, matrix F, uh, V, sorry. So into the rows of V. You see this dynamic. So dynamic is meaning that we don't know at compile time what the length, the number of rows of these matrices will be. So the top one will be N if it's N vertices, and the bottom one will be M for M faces. Then we have three columns. Sometimes we get lazy and we'll just treat both dimensions as dynamic because, well, to be honest, there's a keyword shortcut for it. 
OK, so we have a list of vertices and a list of faces. So let's see an example of this. So here are the coordinates for all the corners of a cube and the indices for all the triangle faces of that cube. So we have uh, 12 faces, two triangles per side of the cube, and we have eight vertices. Um, and this should look very familiar. If, you're, if you've looked at triangle uh, mesh file formats before, so if we read in this cube from an OBJ format, we would really be just translating what's already inside the OBJ format into the triangle mesh. So this already gives us a lot of flexibility within our data structure. So we're, we place no requirements on our triangle mesh other than that it stores triangles with real coordinate vertices. So there's no manifoldness requirements necessarily. So storing raw matrices has a lot of advantages. It's memory efficient. It's cache friendly. Indices are well, often simpler to debug than pointers placing in all sorts of places in memory. Uh, raw matrices can be trivially copied and serialized. We want to save our data at checkpoints throughout our code, which I think Daniele will mention is a good coding style to adopt. Um, and it's also the least common denominator between data types. So part of research is taking advantage of the fact that other people have written code already. So Seagull might have some complicated uh, technique, and we wanted to be able to use that quickly, find out whether or not it works, maybe move on to something else. So libIGL, we take the least common denominator across all data types, which makes it very easy to pass our data to other libraries like OpenGL, OpenCV, MATLAB, Seagull, and to take their data, uh, data structures and pull them back into uh, the raw matrix format. But I would say uh, most importantly about this raw matrix format is that it immediately affords or enables linear algebra. So most of the math that we're doing in, uh, in geometry processing can boil down to linear algebra operations on sets. So having the vertex position as a matrix will immediately allow us to do something like this, which is Laplace and smoothing. So we say, OK, we're going to take our vertices V, and we're going to subtract off uh, the Laplace of V weighted by some amount, and that's going to give us new positions U. And this gets immediately translated into code. We can say we have a new vertex list U, and that's going to be our old vertex list V minus the Laplace as a sparse matrix times our vertex list. So we can take our linear algebra in math and immediately translate that into code. So let's dig a little deeper in this. So what do we mean? So in a very discrete sense, we want to update every vertex I with a new position, which should be the old position minus the Laplace at our ith vertex. Remember, the Laplace is pointing towards the average of its neighbors. So if we write this out, say, OK, my Laplace should be some weighted combination of the difference between me and my neighbors. And this is a linear operation in our vertex positions. And since it's a linear operation, that means we can represent it as a matrix. And it's a sparse matrix because we're only looking at the neighbors at any given point. Writing it out in matrix form also reveals to us that it's acting independently on each column. So it's acting independently on x, y, and z. So we sort of get that for free when we apply this uh, to the vertex positions as a matrix. So our math has directly translated into code. So this is very convenient. When we're looking at a paper and we're trying to implement this, we can see that our code is matching up. So we can take step by step uh, through many uh, common geometry processing papers and see how they immediately translate to code in each step. So here's a little preview of doing uh, geometric smoothing on this noisy airplane mesh. And we can see that it's getting uh, smoothed out over time. So we're repeatedly applying this geometric smoothing. So if I hide the eigen part, you can see that the code that we've written here looks a lot like MATLAB code, or looks like NumPy uh, Python code, maybe missing some NP dot sprinkled around. Um, 
And actually, if you dig into code written with libigl and eigen, a lot of it really looks like high-level MATLAB or Python code. And we've implemented, oh, you can't see anything on the, on the screen, but these are saying things like cross product, find, unique. Um, we have color maps from MATLAB. You can really take a MATLAB function and almost directly translate this into C++. So researchers like myself, I do a lot of fast prototyping in MATLAB because it has all the solvers there. Then I want to eventually move to C++. So a lot of our libigl subroutines make this as smooth as possible. So you can get into C++ and maybe do something uh, more efficient. And Daniele will talk about how we can actually keep you in your high-level language if that happens to be Python or pretty soon uh, JavaScript. A lot of the libigl routines are now exposed directly within Python. So part of the success of libigl in uh, having an easy-to-use API is that we're embracing these matrices as our primary data structure for inputs and outputs. So if you open up uh, a generic libigl function, if it takes in a mesh, it's typically taking that as a list of vertices and a list of faces, and it's outputting something that's maybe a list of vertices long. So if we're computing some quantity at every vertex, it'll be a number of vertices by one uh, vector. So for example, the function that computes Gaussian curvature takes in the vertices and faces and outputs a vector of, uh, of Gaussian curvature values. Similarly, the function double area computes twice the area of every face. So we have number of faces by one in this case. So outputting again a number, uh, a vector. Sometimes it's not just a single vector, but we have a matrix as output every row of the per face normals is the normal at a face, the normal vector uh, at some face. And similarly, per vertex normals is number of vertices by three. Now we think about how we would compute per vertex normals. A lot of times you take an average of your face normal. See some nodding heads, right? So if I have a face list and I want to add up the adjacent faces or some data stored at adjacent faces, suddenly some alarms are going off. Like, wait a minute, this is going to be super inefficient. I'm going to have to be zipping up and down that face list to find out which faces are adjacent to each vertex. So wasn't this why half-edge data structures were invented? Like, shouldn't we need a, a mesh data structure to be able uh, to compute something like this? And indeed, if we had a half-edge data structure where you could ask who is the, the face adjacent to this vertex, you could write sort of a standard loop like this to compute the normals at every vertex. So you loop over vertices, and initialize that to zero, loop over all the faces that are adjacent to that vertex, and add that face's normal to my running list, and then maybe divide at the end or normalize to get, to get out the uh, per-vertex normal. So this is one way to do it. There's nothing wrong with this necessarily. And you can think of this as sort of going around and gathering things in place. We're going to visit each vertex and sort of gather up the information that I need and store that and move on to the next one. So in libigl, we've noticed that a lot of things we can actually do on our raw matrix data structure. If we take sort of a different approach, um, sort of spin these loops out a different way. So instead, we can initialize everything to zero loop over faces, visit every corner of that face, sort of throw my normal at each of the corners, and then do a little bit of cleanup or reduction at the end to normalize those. So we can think of this as sort of throwing. So the other thing was gathering. This is, I don't know, the hunter version. Scattering is, is probably the, the correct way of thinking. So we're scattering this data and we're accumulating this. So this should be familiar some uh, like a map reduce paradigm. Uh, for coding. And this will directly translate into code. So we can flip between sort of the pseudocode and the actual code that uses our matrix list. Um, and this presumably will compile if I didn't make any copy paste mistakes. What if you need to visit random and circulation order places? Yeah, so um, there are a lot of techniques that don't necessarily need that. Um, so when we can avoid it, we like to use the uh, raw face list. 
Sometimes you can rejig a circulation thing to be something where you can iterate over edges. So we'll first compute a directed edge list and then visit edges. So that's another way you can sort of flip loops inside out. But if you definitely need a circulation order, we have uh, data structures that will compute those uh, ahead of time. So we can, we can we're not like uh, sort of polemic in the sense that we'll like never touch an adjacency list or something like that. Um, but we're not trying to have you commit to a particular mesh data structure so that if you want to use libidl, like you must have a manifold uh, blah, blah, blah mesh. So we try to use um, assumptions on the type of data when and if we need them. Um, so off the top of my head, can I think of something where we do something with circulation order? Can you think of some the function? Global, some, some, something in the global parameterization part needs to really follow the order for cutting and for yeah. And for that, we are using, so there is a sort of visitor that behaves like an alt fetch, but internally it's not keeping an alt fetch. It's just using the information that we have to simulate the behavior of the main mesh. So and it's good until you don't have to change the topology. Yeah, the, the sort of, uh, as a testament to how far you can push this stuff without actually committing to a half as edge data structure, I uh, accepted a challenge on myself to implement a mesh decimation algorithm. We're doing lots of local operations. So typically that's the killer, right? Doing lots of local operations and the combinatorics are changing and the numbers are changing. So typically it's like, oh, I don't want to go anywhere near matrices because I'm going to have to be reallocating things all the time. Uh, but even with mesh decimation, if you're clever about uh, where you're storing things and getting rid of things, um, you can implement that using matrix data structures. That's more of a like proof of concept, not necessarily the best practices way to do decimation, but um, as a sort of uh, proof that, that uh, this can happen. Yeah, so to reiterate, we're not adverse uh, to connectivity data structures, but we use them when and if, so that the API can really be as simple as possible and not necessarily make any assumptions. So a lot of our functions will work or at least degrade gracefully on non-manifold input in the sense that maybe only near the non-manifold bits do the outputs not make sense or are somewhat questionable. Whereas other libraries that say you must convert this to a manifold data structure just won't give you anything. Um, and this gives a lot of freedom for research prototyping. So back to the sort of core uh, motivation for libIGL. So simple matrix-based API and then a header-only installation. So anyone who's done C++ knows that it can be a huge headache to deal with compiling other people's code. Um, we put a lot of emphasis on making sure that our, compo our code is easy to use right out of the box. Um, and one of the ways that we do that is with uh, uh, making sure that it's header only. So if you want to read a mesh and compute normals, all you have to do is download our code and add two lines. Include read triangle mesh and read per vertex normals. That leads to the next thing, which is that we're a function-based library and every function has a corresponding header file. So per vertex normals exists in the per vertex normal dot h file, and nothing else exists there except for that. Uh, so it's a bijection between functions and files. It makes it easy to sort of find what you're looking for and make sure that you're not pulling in a bunch of code that you don't necessarily need. And lastly, we wanted zero dependencies. So okay, it's not really zero dependencies. You already saw that eigen is a dependency, but minimal dependencies. And we strive to keep the dependencies uh, encapsulated in our repository. So Eigen, for example, when you, when you download libIGL, will already be there for you, and it will be the right version and everything. Um, and we organize our code according to dependencies. So the main code for our library is in the include slash IGL, which means you're in the IGL namespace. And anything at this level, at the top level, only depends on the standard uh, library for C++ and Eigen, nothing else. And this is roughly 70% of libIGL. So the majority of libIGL only depends on STL and Eigen. Um, and I can mention off the bat that the, li the license for libIGL is the same as Eigen, which is the Mozilla uh, public license too, which is pretty commercial friendly. Now when we do have a dependency, like we want to link to tetgen and make it easy to call tetgen in the inside of research code, then we explicitly denominate this by having a tetgen folder 
and having a tetragon namespace. So if you want to call tetrahedralization, you know just by the namespace or where you're including that header file that you're going to need to install tetgen. And similarly, for copyleft type of code, like GPL type license, we've moved these into a separate folder so that commercial users know when they're in that sort of dangerous territory of using code that's not uh, necessarily uh, easy for uh, commercial use. So anything with a GPL type of license or a non, uh, well, start saying free, people are gonna lose their minds, but a GPL type license, let's leave it at that, is in the copy left folder and copy left namespace. Um, like the uh, marching cubes implementation we have. Okay, so I'm about to hand it off to Daniele, but I would love uh, to field any other questions related to sort of the motivation for LibIGL or what you can expect from the organization if there are any. Okay, so in that case, I'll pass on to Daniele, who will talk, uh, will take you through a bit of a tour through the functionalities of LibIGL. We're going to do a laptop swap. If you want to swap, can yes. I, I was wondering a little bit about one thing about your class. I think it does, it does, it does because uh, I don't think you can use range page four, which is maybe because I can does it, but, but are you sort of tracking the, the evolution of the language and it's also a bit quicker than that? Or, uh, yeah, so uh, I should have probably written uh, when I said the dependencies are SDL and Eigen, that we're also dependent on C11. Okay, it's 2017 now, but <laughs> C11 is still kind of like modern in some sense. Um, and we are, we are using uh, some of these techniques. We have a, um, we have a homebrewed uh, parallel for loop built on the C11 thread, so when we can. Uh, parallelize something, we tend to do it through the, the, uh, the thread library that's already there in uh, C11. Uh, we monitor the Eigen development, so there is some push inside of Eigen, it's not clear when that will come out to do range based for loops um, and the other fancier things in Eigen that we're super excited about once uh, they're sort of ready. Um, so yeah, I, I I think there's I don't I don't necessarily see any contradiction with, with that sort of view, other than like we wanted we wanted to make sure that the li the linear algebra was sort of rock steady, and Eigen was really the library uh, to commit to do that, and it's been great so far, and they're they're excellent maintainers of the library, so we're definitely sticking with Eigen. So we're sort of at their mercy in terms of what they decide to do with the range based order. But. The item itself it, it, like, it uses these description kind of templates underneath, and it also has the custom map type so that I can take a regular array and treat it as a matrix. Will that work with your library as well, or do you basically require a copy into one of these matrix XD nodes? So we made a mistake at the very early stages of the BIGL in which template we, uh, we sort of exposed for input types. And that is slowly getting eradicated through the library. So the, the sort of safe answer is no. Um, the, the like more complicated answer is that like scattered throughout the library, a lot of functions are already used. Um, and we can talk in detail about like what you should look for in the functions and know that you can. Um, yeah, so, so like, like uh, yeah, I mean, like, you know, this is, this is work that we do as we do research, so we made a couple mistakes. Um, but, uh, yeah, that, that's a super cool feature of Eigen, and we, and we try to expose that. Um, as, like, sort of a personal anecdote, in research code, I've never had, like, the copy be the bottleneck. Personal anecdote, models may vary. Usually I'm doing some, like, linear solve or something that's, like, the bottleneck. All right, uh, yeah. so as long as we're asking philosophical questions. Uh, you cited this fact that isn't it nice that papers are written using linear algebra and so you can translate directly from paper linear algebra and say from the code. But for me, when I'm reading the paper, the fact that everything is encoded in the matrix is often the most annoying part. Uh, and, and so in a sense, you know, MATLAB is kind of a domain-specific language for linear algebra, but we're doing geometry processes. So does it maybe make, does, is it maybe a historical artifact where we use that we're using linear algorithm language for geometry processing, and might we 
be better served by actually having a domain specific language that actually is connected with geometry. I, I think that's really cool. I think it's it's like it's far enough in the future that it would be hard to have a library today that would do sure, that. Of course. The one hiccup that I, I see with that is the same hiccup that uh, for me makes other uh, mesh processing libraries difficult to use, which is it's easier to do that once you start making assumptions on the data. So you would say like, okay, I'm only going to deal with manifold flow geometry. Then already I can I can make my data structure really tidy and neat. The thing I love about uh, sort of the least common denominator is when I want to do some non-manifold triangle soup jump, I'm using the same thing as when I, when I did uh, the manifold mesh. Uh, so so you, in the paper you can write that there's a map from vertices to yeah. complex numbers. Yes. Right? And this doesn't necessarily have anything about that. That's right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's an inherent order in the way that we store the vertices that is arbitrary. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There is a push in languages that are going in this direction. There is one researcher at Adobe, Shoaib, that is working on these. He has like a specific language to build FEM matrices. But like it's hard to have something like this that is generic for everything that you might want to do. Yeah, I don't want to eat too much of yep. Daniel's time, so maybe we uh, transition. Oops. You want to get your laptop? Yeah, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm Daniele, and I'm going to give you a tour of the uh, core functionalities in LibIGL. And then before we go there, I would like just to go with you, take a look at the website of LibIGL, and in particular of the tutorial. So let's go back. When you uh, open the GitHub of LibIGL, you land in this page. And what I'm going to show you now is what's happening under the tutorial section that you can find here. And everything that is in here will work out of the box on Windows, Mac, and Linux as long as you carefully follow the instructions. So it's very important that when you clone the repository, you're using these uh, additional parameter recursive. So what this parameter will do is download not only the code of libigl, but also most of the dependencies that it has for sp very specific features. In particular, we have here uh, TetGen, uh, an XML exporter, Triangle, NanoGUI, Embry, and so on. So if you, well, what's happening when you uh, download with recursive is that you get something that looks like this. Let me open it here. So you're seeing the screen, right? Is the text? Yeah. OK, so um, LibIGL has a bunch of folders. And the one we care about now is this tutorial folder that contains a list of demos. And in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to go through some of them and show uh, how they work. But the structure is the same. So every demo is mostly independent. It has a CMake file to compile. And I will say a little bit more about CMake in a moment. And then usually it has one single CPP that contains all the code that is needed for that demo. So they are completely self-contained. So if you want to set up the tutorials on your machine, what you have to do is to start from uh, the root of libigl. Is, is the text readable for everyone, also the one in the back? Yeah? OK. So. What you have to do is download clone libigl. Then when you're done, you go into the tutorial folder. You create a folder called build. Then you move inside this build folder. And then in here, you need to create a make file for, for, for compiling the entire tutorial. So this is done by, pressing, by typing cmake dot dot slash. And this will create a make file. So this will do different things depending on which operating system you are. If you are on Mac, you're going to get a make file, and then you can just press make to compile the library. Um, if you are on, um, on Windows, you're going to get a Visual Studio project. So you can just double click on it with Visual Studio and compile it there. And if you are on Linux, you are also uh, going to get a make file. Um, so after you're done compiling, 
that I already did it here, what you get is a folder with a bunch of binaries, and these binaries correspond to the tutorials. So for example, here we were looking at a very simple one. This is uh, a simple tutorial that is drawing a mesh. And let's just take a look at what's happening here. So we are including at the top a couple of files from libigl. One is read OFF, that is a function to read a mesh in OFF format. And the second one is a simple mesh viewer that comes bundled with libigl. So then in the code, we are defining two matrices. This matrix XD is a matrix of floating of doubles that con will contain the coordinates of our mesh. The matrix F is a matrix of integer. These are the indices that compose the faces. And then the code is very simple. It's just calling IGL read of F OFF to load this file and save the mesh into V and F. And then there are these three lines that are creating a viewer, sending the mesh to the viewer, and launching it. So this is a fully working uh, application. We can call it here and see what it does. And so what you get out of it is, well, a mesh with a simple viewer that allows you to move it around and to zoom in and out and to hide or show the wireframe, OK? So this is just uh, a simple tutorial just to give you an idea of what uh, can be done with these. But let's look at some more interesting features. So let's open the tutorial. And let's take a look at these. So the tutorial is divided into chapters. The first one is really only describing at a high level this basic structure of all the tutorials and how to plot meshes. We are going to skip it because it's not particularly interesting. The second one is describing how to compute discrete geometric quantities and operators. And we can take a look at some of them. For example, the computation of Gaussian curvature on a surface. So if you click here, you go to a brief description of what Gaussian curvature is and a link to the code. So I'm going to open it in this editor because it's more convenient. So this is another example. So let's see if I can fit it all in one screen. So you can see that also here the structure is quite simple. We are reading a mesh as before. And then we are calling an IGL function that is computing Gaussian curvature. And you can see that the prototype is quite simple to read. So it's taking as input the vertices and the faces of your mesh. And it's giving out a vector that contains the Gaussian curvature calculated for every vertex. Uh, here is also computing it in two ways. And then it's uh, plotting it. And by plotting it, what we need to plot is not only to send a mesh, but we also need to send the colors associated with the vertices of the mesh. And so to convert from the curvature value to the color, we use this jet function that is similar to what you have in MATLAB. In MATLAB, there is a function that is also called uh, jet. So let's take a look at this. So this is 202. And here we go. So here we have a small cube. And you can see here the curvature uh, plotted. OK, so this is how all the tutorial looks like. And now as we go deeper and deeper in, uh, in this example, they are going to become more uh, complex. So for example, and I'm not going to show the code for, for all of them. Uh, another interesting one is 203, that is computing curvature directions. So this is a slightly more complex computation. And what this gives you is uh, a pair of uh, directions for every point of a surface that corresponds to the direction of maximal and uh, of minimal curvature. And this algorithm is actually quite simple to implement, but it will still require probably a day or two. Because what's happening in the code here is that for every point of a surface, we are fitting an analytic function, and then we are computing the uh, curvature of this analytic function. And it's a basic tool that comes handy pretty often. So if you ever need something like this, you know that it's just one function call away if you, if you look at it in, in libigl. Um, so let's see. Let me resume with my slide. So 
other, uh, another cool demo that we have is 204. This is a demo that shows how to compute the uh, Laplacian operator. It's following up on what Alec was uh, discussing before. And we have a demo where we are implementing um, a smoothing procedure using the Laplacian operator. So we start with this cow, and now every time I'll press space, uh, there is the mesh is going to be smoothed using the conformalized mean flow. And as we continue to do these, we are going to get more and more smooth until we reach a sphere. Okay. And like if we took a look at the code that is doing this, so this is 205. You see that the code is starting to become a bit more complex than what we had before, but it's still reasonably short. Like all of these UI included is around 100 lines of code. OK, so more features that we have. Let's move to uh, another chapter, to chapter 4. This is for deforming shapes. And here there are a bunch of uh, demos. Let's just quickly go through all of them. So we start with 401. This is computing a biharmonic deformation by fixing a few uh, vertices, the ones that are in blue and then trying to find the rest of the surface by solving this equation that is asking that in the yellow point, the bilaplacian should be 0. And you see that it's very smooth. And then we can do the same by not interpolating directly the coordinates, but by interpolating the displacement. And in this way, we get a pretty powerful shape deformation method that works well only for a small deformation. Like If you try to use these for very large stretches, as you can see here, the method is linear, so the stretch is going to be uniformly distributed over the entire region, and it will not look uh, natural. Then we can check 403. So this one is going to take a little bit longer to, uh, to run. So this is the implementation of a paper that uh, Alec published uh, four years ago, four or five years ago. Uh, it's called bounding by harmonic weight. So what this example is doing is starting from a um, mesh that is equipped with a skeleton. And the algorithm is automatically figuring out how to connect every bone, every one of these segments, to a part of a mesh. So then when I press space, what it will happen is that the skeleton will start to move. And as the skeleton moves, the bounded, bounded by harmonic weights are used to deform the rest of the surface using linear blend skinning. So this is already an involved demo, because there are multiple pieces that are playing here. There is everything that is needed to do linear blend skinning. There is an optimization framework to compute BBWs. There is everything that you need to load meshes, to load the skeleton, and to create the animation. So these more complicated demos, well, they are useful on its own if you're interested in computing BBWs, but can also be useful just as nice pieces of code that you can steal and use. For example, if you need to do linear blend skinning, there is no reason to reimplement it from scratch. You can just take out of this demo the part that is doing the linear blend skinning. And since everything is divided into self-contained function, if you take a look inside here, you see that every, all the entire part that is doing LBS is actually nicely uh, encapsulated in functions in LibIGL. So it's very easy to uh, just use that part. Um, so we also have a demo for dual quaternion skinning that is a variant that is better suited for handling uh, joints. It has a better quality and prevents shrink wrapping artifact on the joint. And finally, there is also a demo of uh, as rigid as possible that is uh, simulating the deformation of a mesh, considering the mesh as a thin rubber shell, like a thin elastic shell. Um, so what's it's happening 
in this demo is that you have constraints that are moved, so the two uh, feet and uh, a part of the head are moved around. And in real time, since the mesh is small in this case, we are computing um, a deformation using as rigid as possible. Again, all of these are small pieces of code that are very easy to take out and reuse. Um, so this is an overview of what we have in for shape deformation. Now I would like to move on uh, parameterization, something that you saw this morning in, uh, in the lecture of Keenan. And here we have a few basic uh, parameterization algorithms. So the simplest one is uh, an harmonic mapping, where you take an object like this one here, and um, it's, uh, it's a disk. The topology of this object is a disk, so it has only one single boundary. And what we are doing here is take the boundary, force the boundary to be uh, mapped to a circle. And then after the boundary is mapped to a circle, we are um, minimizing the Laplacian energy to get the position for all the vertices that are in the middle. And here is what you get. So here is what happens if you show the mesh on top of, uh, of this checkerboard. And now if we look at what happens in 3D, is that you have the checkerboard transported onto this surface. And we can take a look at this example, because I think it's another one where uh, that well exemplifies how things can be coded using libigl. Let's see. Here we go. So just a little bit of code just to handle the, the keyboard. But this is the key part of the implementation. So you see that the code is, is quite simple to follow. So we start by reading a mesh, as in the simple example that uh, I showed in the beginning. Then we find the boundary loop. So this is a function that returns you all the vertices that are in the boundary sorted. Um, then we map these vertices to a circle. We compute an harmonic parameterization. We just rescale the UVs to, to, make it, to make the checkerboard more visible. And then we send the mesh and the UVs coordinates to the viewer. So when you see that certain things, like the big advantage of using matrices here to represent, in this case, the UV coordinates, is that things like, I want to scale all the UV coordinates by 5, can be very efficiently written if you have matrices. Just, this is just multiplying every number in the matrix by 5. So just using matrices, it's when, when, when you get used to it, it's a convenient way of, of handling meshes. Um, so another popular uh, algorithm is, uh, for parameterization is least square conformal maps. You can already see by looking at these that has less distortion than the previous one. And the reason for this is that this algorithm does not need to have a fixed boundary. So what this is trying to do is to compute a map that is uh, conformal. I mean, we dis Keenan discussed it this morning. And in this case, there is no need to fix the boundary. So by letting the boundary free, you get uh, a higher quality in the parameterization. A more complex but also popular algorithm is as rigid as possible parameterization, where what you are trying to do is to compute a map that is as isometric as possible. So instead of trying to preserve angles in your map, you're trying to preserve distances. And this is the result that you get. If we look at the um, parameterization in the U map, the in the UV map, what you can immediately notice is that now the size of the triangles here is much more uniform than what we saw before. I can actually show both of them so that we can compare. Let me actually just kill it and launch another one. You see that in this case here, you have a large difference in area between the one on the side and the one in the center. OK, so just uh, a few more. Um, I would like to jump to the
Yeah, there we go. So there are a bunch more parameterization algorithms in, in LibIGL, but I just don't want to go through all of them. But I would like to conclude the parameterization part with this example that is uh, a more recent method that is called uh, local injective maps that has the advantage of always computing parameterization where the elements cannot flip. So like whenever, ev whenever the triangles are flattened, the normal of all the triangles will always point up. And this is a nice property that it's useful in many tasks in, in geometry processing. And here you can see how the algorithm works. And just in a few iteration, this converges to a good uh, parameterization. And here it's optimizing for isometry. And you can see that it's reasonably fast considering how dense uh, this mesh is. And many of the algorithms that I just discussed actually also work in 3D. So for many functions in LibIGL, you, you need to check the, the manual of the function first, but many of them actually accept either triangle meshes or tetrahedral meshes. So if you provide, uh, all the meshes are always specified but these by a matrix V with the vertices and a matrix F with the faces. And so if you call the function with a matrix of faces where you only have three columns, it will consider it as a mesh of triangles. If you pass a matrix F with four columns, it will treat it as a mesh of tetrahedra. And this is handled automatically, and ma many functions uh, support this. So in this example here, we are using exactly the same function that I showed before, but now we are trying to use it to compute a volumetric deformation. So we have a collection of tetrahedra, we have some constraints, I'm gonna twist the side of this cube, and I'm going to figure out what happens inside, trying to be uh, as isometric as possible. And uh, now the optimization is much slower. There are already a few million tetrahedras inside this thing. And the algorithm takes a bit more to converge. But here you go. So like just in a few iterations, you get this pretty dramatic deformation that is trying to keep the size of a uh, tetrahedra as uh, homogeneous as possible. And also in this case, we have the same nice guarantee as what I mentioned before. We are guaranteed that the tetrahedra cannot flip. No matter what constraints you fix, they will never flip. OK, so this was a quick overview. Let's just check here. Yeah, so this was a quick overview of all the um, core fun functionalities in LibIGL. There is a lot more, and we actually encourage you to just skim through the tutorial and take a look if you see anything that could be uh, interesting for you. So I think it's now a good time to take a, a five minutes break. And we will resume at five. And we will set up and code up one simple example together and then show you what is the best way to start a new project using uh, LibIGL. Thank you. I want to start with an easier way that will actually allow you to get access to around 70% of LibIGL. And it's just to start from scratch without even using the CMake project that we use for the tutorials. So let me show you uh, the setup that I have here. So one of these windows is the right one here. So what I have here is a copy of LibIGL that I cloned earlier today. I have a mesh in, in OBJ format. And what I want to show you is how to write a simple program that is loading this mesh and computing a statistic. For example, we are going to compute the average, uh, the mean of the um, areas of the faces. So um, let me open an editor here. OK, so we start with this uh, simple example. And to compile, I am using this command line. So I'm calling directly 
uh, G++, I'm saying that the code is going to be C++11, and this is a very important thing. LibIGL will not compile if you don't specify that it's C++11. Then I have two include folders for um, Eigen and for LibIGL, so that the headers of both LibIGL and Eigen are going to be available. And since both LibIGL and Eigen are header only, there is nothing else that you need to do at this point. And then you can just say what file you want to compile. So now if you just compile these, we're going to get uh, a binary that doesn't do anything. OK, so now um, just to reiterate, what uh, I want to show you is how to load a mesh and how to compute areas. So let's start by loading a mesh. So first of all, we need to have the variables where we plan to store the mesh. So what we need here are two matrices, one um, that is made of floats, and we will call it V. And this is going to be the matrix that will contain our vertices. And then another one, this time of integers, that contains our faces. And now to uh, read the mesh, we need to check uh, the type of file that we have. We have an OBJ, so we are going to use the function read OBJ. So my suggestion to find functions in libigl is to have an editor that allows you to do full text search on the file names so that you can just write what you're looking for, and then the editor can help you autocomplete. So in this case, it's read obj. And when we open here, um, let's take a look. So it's a function that uh, in for every function in libigl, we try to have a good documentation. It's not completely consistent yet, but we are doing our best. So there is a text description of what it does. There is a description of what the templates are. And then there is a list of the input and the outputs. Um, in this case, there are multiple copies. There can be multiple copies of this function and with different set of parameters. In this case, like this function is reading a lot of extra stuff, like texture coordinate and corner normals that we don't care about. And for this example, we are just going to use the last prototype in this file that want us input the name of a file and then writes the content of a file inside V and F. So we can go on the other side and we're just going to say IGL, read OBJ, the name of a file, which is um, cubetwist.obj, V and F. Um, we might have to put the absolute path here. Let's do it. I, I'm, I think we have to just be sure so that it will not break. OK. So at this point, just to make sure that we did everything right, we can check what's happening in V. So now we go back to our terminal. I have a typo. Let's see. This is pair programming. You gotta return my URL soon. Wait, wait, wait. Well, you don't have to, but it's So what did I manage to do wrong? Oh, and L, yes. And we also miss some includes here. So we also need to include Eigen core. And we need to include the single function of libigl that we are using. So let's see if we are lucky this time. Yeah. And here we go. So we already have a simple working application that is just reading the OBJ. And now if we want to compute the areas, we need to do the same. So we look for a function that, in this case, is called double area. It has the same format as before. The documentation is the same as before. And what we need to provide here is we need to provide the mesh, V and F, as input. And as output, we get uh, a vector that contains the area for all the triangles. So again, we go on this side. We include um, IGL uh, double area dot H. We 
plus v f and now we need another matrix where we save the result and now we can just plot the area no typos and these are the areas of all the faces if we want the mean you can simply say that we want the mean of a And there we go, this is the mean. So this is the easiest way to use the library. So as long as you're using functions that are in this namespace, so only IGL, then they will work out of the box in this way. And as you can see, it's easy to use only small parts of a library. Like here, every function could be used independently. And the fact that we're using matrices for everything makes it easy to integrate these with, with other libraries. Uh, again, the fact that we are storing things as vectors means that we have access to operation that works on vectors that are convenient. OK, so any question on these? So I'll try to follow, but is it true that the icon is under nanoGUI? External yes, okay. it's correct. Yeah, there is this strange nesting just because we didn't want to have two copies of eigen, and we wanted to have only one and a consistent one. Okay. Um, if there, there's only one return value. Why is the return value returned within the argument list and not as a return type? Because C++ supports return value optimization. Yeah, so uh, the reason why it was done in, uh, in this way is because at the time when we started this, not all the compilers were doing the optimization and also for consistencies because mm. the majority of the function actually returns more than one. Mm. So in this way, we just decided to keep it simple, and we have the same uh, style everywhere. Okay. There's also a subtlety with the templating. So if you have it as a return type, the compiler won't pick up on the template. Where this, like Daniela used matrix XD, mm. but it's returning a vector. So you could also use vector XD, mm. or you could use uh, vector float, and the functions will just pick this up. So we're losing a little bit on the return type optimization, but. If it's, if it's starting something new like this, there's no logs. OK. OK, any other question? OK, then we move to the second way of using the library, but it's the one that I recommend if you plan to use many of the features that we have. And it's to. many here we go can do it here so and it's to use uh, an additional feature that we have in the uh, documentation of libigl if you go to the main github and you look at the documentation there is this section describing this example project so this is another way of using the library this uh, blank project is another git repository that contains a minimal self-contained example so let's go ahead and clone these. So we get these, we go to our terminal. One important thing is that whenever you are cloning this example project, you need to clone it in the same folder where you also have a copy of libigl, because it's going to look for it there. So we can clone this repository. Now we have it here. It's pretty bare bone, there is only a readme, a CMake list, and a CPP. So now we can go inside this folder. We can do exactly as we did for the tutorials. We can create a folder in here for the build. We go inside, we launch CMake. And after this is done, we can compile. So what is happening now is that CMake will automatically take care of all the dependencies that are necessary. So all the uh, extra libraries that are necessary, for example, to render glfw, are going to be statically linked into your binary. So they are all contained inside the libigl folder, and they are all statically linked. So the binary that you get out of these has zero dependencies. Um, after this is done, we can launch it. And this is what we see. We see just a cube that is already integrated in the viewer. So let me just show you how the code looks like. 
So we have two interesting things to look at here. So one is the CMake file that is very similar to the one in the tutorial. And it's something that it's already taking care of a lot of annoying problems that have to deal if you are on Windows or if you are on Mac or Linux. This is already taking care of everything for you. And, um, and then later on, you have this list of options that you can directly change. And so these are enabling the external dependencies that we have. So if you turn these things to on, your initial compilation time is going to go up because there is more stuff to compile. And every one of these libraries is going to uh, be linked statically with your binary. So you don't have to worry about downloading them or doing anything else. It will just work out of the box. Uh, there is only one exception, that is Seagull. So if you want to, uh, to have a demo that uses Seagull, you need to download it externally because compiling it statically and linking it statically is something that we didn't uh, master yet. And just as an example, we can recompile the demo turning on the UI. So let's go in here. We need to make a new build with nano GUI. Just want to be sure it's the right terminal. Yes. So now you'll see that this is going to take a little bit longer than before, because now it also has to compile the entire nano GUI. And while it's doing it, I want to just explain why we are insisting with having static builds. And the reason is that on Windows, it's almost impossible to get things to work nicely if you're not compiling everything in one shot. So in this way, at least, you always get all the flags right in Visual Studio, and it just works out of the box without having to deal with 32 or 64 bit, multi-threaded or not, and all these. Uh, nightmares. OK, so we are almost done. And so now you see that we have the same cube as before, but we also have this uh, GUI on the left that allows you to change rendering property, to invert normals, to snap. Um, to some views. And this bar here is completely customizable. So in the actual code, if you want to add additional things here or have a separate bar, you can do it. And it's very easy. So this entire bar is constructed by simply saying, I want to have something in the UI for this specific, per this specific variable. And then the code will automatically figure out what is the type of a variable, what kind of control needs to go there, and take care of all the callbacks. So if you want to have something with 10 items here, it's literally 10 lines of code in, uh, in LibIGL. OK, so this is a quick overview of how it works. So if you want to proceed in this way, the rule, uh, the rule of thumb is if you have a function that in a namespace like IGL uh, dot dot tetgen, you will need to turn on the tetgen option here if you want to get it to compile. Same thing for Mosaic or Seagull or any one of these, of these libraries. OK, so this is the second way uh, to use it. Any question on this? OK, then we are moving to the more spicy uh, new features. And there are a few of them. So I will start with one that I believe it's really important. And it's just a good habit that I encourage everyone in this room to adopt. And it's the one of serializing everything. So let me just show uh, what I mean. Let me make this a bit bigger. So LibIGL as a serialization framework that is contained in one single .h. You don't need anything else. And what this allows you to do is to say, whatever variable you have, you can just say, I want to save the content on this variable into a file that you can specify under the name that you provide here. So this file that you get is just a binary dump of whatever type you want to save. And then you can simply, using deserialize, getting back the value that is in there. And this works with all the standard C++ types and also more or less everything that is in Eigen. So since we are mostly using Eigen, this means that you can serialize 
more or less everything that is in LibIGL. I mean, even like the viewer and some more complicated classes can be directly serialized in this way. So the reason why I insist that this is useful is because a good way to prototype software is to always have the entire state in your application serializable, everything that you have, all the variables that you have. And the reason for this is it will make your life so much easier because if you, have, if you have to debug something, you have a crash at some point, what you can do is serialize immediately before it happens and then you can have another application that is just deserializing and starting from there. So instead of having to wait like a minute or two to reach the point where it crashes, you are immediately there. And this like, might sound like a small thing, like why, who cares, we are saving one minute of two, but it's actually likely that you're gonna launch and try to debug the same thing hundreds of times. So this actually sum up to multiple hours per day that you can save. And with something like this, it's really easy to do. There is no reason not to do it. The only thing is that you need to be careful and from the beginning of a project, every time you have a new variable, just you need to add a little bit of code to save it. And, um, and I think this is a good habit this is not the only library that allows you to do serialization. There are many more. The purpose of these, like many other things in LibIGL, is to try to make it as simple as possible. So here, the way it works is that if you provide true here, it's gonna erase the file and only save this variable. If you don't provide the, the last Boolean parameter, it's gonna just append what you have to uh, the previous file. So it's just, very simple, you need to have somewhere in your code a long list of serialized to dump everything and somewhere else the, the deserialized to reload it. Um, yeah, so this is uh, one of the new feature uh, I wanted to describe. Another one is a set of uh, booleans. So I need to find again the right terminal. I think it's this one. Um, Uh huh. Wait. I like. Do you remember what is the number of a boolean? Yeah. Uh, six oh nine. Six oh nine. Okay. So LibIGL contains the most. The, uh, the most robust implementation of Booleans for triangle meshes that is currently available. And uh, this library is actually now used in commercial product by uh, ILM and uh, Pixar, Pixar and Pixar. And so what, it, what you can do here is you can take multiple triangle meshes and then you can perform Boolean operations like union, XOR, intersection, difference, and so on. And uh, the code that you actually need is similar to everything else in, in uh, LibIGL is really bare bone. You don't need anything complicated. You just provide two meshes that are represented as V and F. You say what is the operation that you want and the function is gonna do it. Um, so for now, this code depends on Seagull, but we have plans to actually remove the Seagull dependencies in, uh, in the future. Okay, and um, one final feature that I think uh, many of you might be interested in is that we have, um, we are trying to port the entire library. Yes? Do the Boolean uh, algorithm assume that the mesh are watertight? May, are they allowed to have homes and or be in complete models? So the answer to that is a little bit subtle. So one of the powerful things about the algorithm that uh, we've implemented is that we have uh, expanded the concept of what it means to be watertight, sort of generalize this to be a broader class of meshes. Um, we call them piecewise constant winding number methods, and I can point you to a, a paper that will describe exactly what those are. Um, but the basic idea is that if the mesh um, strictly delineates uh, places that are inside of the shape or outside of the shape or maybe twice inside the shape, um, then it's valid input. So the kind of things that this does include that most Boolean libraries wouldn't include is a mesh that overlaps itself, a mesh that has degenerate faces, so like zero area uh, triangles, or if you imagine like you take a cardboard box with two flaps, it's technically open but you close it up 
perfectly. So combinatorially, it looks like an open mesh, but geometrically, it's a closed mesh. So these are all valid inputs because they delineate space mathematically into inside or outside, even if the mesh doesn't look like it would. Um, a mesh with a gaping hole, like just a hole in the side of it, um, basically, you can have one of those. <laughs> so you can you can take one of those meshes and sort of trim it with one of these other kind of mesh, meshes, these nice ones. So I can take a nasty mesh and say, find me all of the parts of the nasty mesh that are inside of the box. Um, if you want to boolean together two nasty meshes, two meshes with, with holes, um, we have some tools that can help you do that. But they're not under the hood of this state-of-the-art uh, robust Boolean algorithm. So um, the, the piece of code that Daniele was showing was um, this broader set of meshes, but still doesn't include uh, gaping holes in it. I hope that gives some sort of answer. You said that the box that's geometrically closed would work. Uh, yes. Even if the width is disconnected from or on the Yes, edge. that's right. Even even if, if along the sort of the the place where they close, even if there's like a different number of vertices on either side. If they are literally collinear, our algorithm will figure out and, and it will it will treat it as a closed object. Yeah here is a, another example of using this algorithm for a CSG tree. Here is a bunch of objects, it's a cube, a sphere, and a few cylinders that are combined first to trim uh, the sphere, and then to drill holes into it. And here is just an example of the sort of thing that you can get uh, using this algorithm. OK, then I, I was just starting to say that another thing that we are trying to do is to get the entire LibIGL exposed to Python. And we are making progress. So there is already a large chunk of the tutorials that run in Python. And you can see the current status by going into the libigl python folder and going to pi igl. And here you can see every file in here is one of the functions that is being wrapped uh, for Python. So just to give an idea of how to use it, first of all, so you need to, it's a very similar uh, procedure to what we saw before for building the entire library. What you need to do is to go into the Python folder, create a folder for building it. Then you go inside the folder, you launch CMake, and after this is done, you press Make. And after a while, I cannot do it live because it takes a while, but you are going to get uh, a file called piigl.so on Mac. And this file here has absolutely zero dependency. So you can just take these, distribute it in a cluster, and it will run on, on any machine. And quite a few people are already starting to use uh, IGL together with PyTorch, because they are just convenient to, to, to use together. Uh, just to give you an idea of, well, first of all, let's just see one uh, demo running. Getting confused with all these windows. So. Let's launch one of the examples that we already saw, the harmonic parameterization. As you can see here, it looks identical to the C++ version that we saw before. And it doesn't only look identical in the result, it also looks very similar in the code. So here is an example of the tutorial written in C++. And here is the same tutorial written in Python using the wrappers. And this was done on purpose so that you can just convert code that is written in C++ with LibIGL to Python, or what is more common, go from the Python code that uses LibIGL to C++ code that uses LibIGL. And uh, one more thing on this topic is that MATLAB is able to load Python modules. So you can load these Python modules in MATLAB and also have access to all these functions from MATLAB just just uh, exactly in the same way. It's just a little bit more annoying because you have by hand to take care of some time conversions between, between NumPy and, and MATLAB. OK. Um, let's go back to the slides. So this is everything. Uh, this was a very quick overview of LibIGL. I hope it was useful to give you an idea of what, in what is in there and give you a uh, initial point to start from. And I would like just to share 
a few coding tips that we sort of came up with after many deadlines that were very painful, both before and after the deadline. And we just share a few tips that I think are useful uh, for minimizing the amount of pain that you will have to sustain before a deadline. And um, so uh, this is published on the LibIGL uh, GitHub. You can find it in uh, general coding tips. And I'm just going to quickly go through them and add something more that is of what is on this document. So the first one, as I already insisted before, it's really important that you serialize everything. And, and this is not only useful for debugging, it's also useful for creating figures. For example, it's a very good idea every time you have a figure ready to serialize everything that you needed to produce that figure and put it together in the repository with a figure. Because if at some point you want to change the viewpoint or you want to change slightly the color, you will save a lot of time, not have to redo everything. And not only this, but it's also easier if you script everything to get your results uh, replicable. Uh, another thing that at least my students don't like, and I think it's very important, is to remember to put a lot of assert in research code. Even simple statements that you know they have to be true, it's always a good idea to put an assert just to be safe. Like the point here is that you are spending a little bit of time and extra code to add a few more lines. But if any of these will trigger at any point in your six or nine months or a year of a project, you will save a lot of time because you'll immediately find all these stupid errors. Things like, if you, for example, if you have a vector, it's a good idea if you are lazy and you don't want to store it as a vector and you store it as a matrix, it's just a good idea to check that this vector only has one column. And all this sort of thing, it's always better to check them with assert. Or if you're solving a linear system, you really want to assert after solving the linear system to check if a system was really solved or something went wrong in the solver. Like it's very hard to find these bugs because you just assume that they work out and it's very easy to catch possible problem with asserts. Like in the same direction is every time there is any quantity in your program that you can plot in some form that is meaningful, you should plot it. Even if it's simple and even if you already know what's in there, it's a good idea to plot it. Because you never know, it doesn't take a long time to plot. And if something is wrong there, then everything that you'll do after it is also going to be wrong. And it's going to be harder and harder as you build on top of it to figure out where the problem is. So if you can plot, just, just do it. Um, number four is another small thing. So it's not OK if your code takes forever to compile. It should take a few seconds and not more. If it takes more than a few seconds, you should just stop what you're doing and fix it and make sure that it takes less than five seconds. Like, it's amazing. If you think about it, if it takes like two, three minutes to compile, that is something that is sort of tolerable. It's not enough to get a coffee every time you're compiling. And you are wasting an incredible amount of time during the day. Like, if you compile 100 times and it's two minutes, it's like 200 minutes. You're wasting like hours per day just they are waiting for this thing to finish. And usually, you can always do this. You can just distribute better your code between .h and .cpp. You can split them. You can reduce the dependencies. It's annoying, but you'll probably already save the time in the same day that you start to do this. Um, another thing is commit often. It doesn't cost you anything. And if you put in there some meaningful text, you can also very easily find bugs whenever uh, they appear. Another thing is that dependencies are bad. So you should really try to not rely on too much external code if you don't trust it. And if you really need to have a dependency, I just recommend to link it statically. It's nice to have a system where you can just take your code in another machine that is not yours and with two lines compile everything. Like It's an incredible pain if it takes a week to get your code deployed somewhere else because you need to download libraries and they need to be specific version. And some of them are coming from Brew and you don't know exactly which version they have. Like it's just a bad habit that in the long term wastes uh, a lot of time. Uh, another thing is everyone will told you probably in software engineering that global variables are absolutely evil and should not be used for anything. And I would just claim that for the things that we are doing, they are absolutely OK. Like if you have an application, it's a small application, it makes completely sense to have a global state where you put all the variables that you need so that they are easy to serialize and you don't forget where they are. 
And of course, I mean, you should not have them for everything, but if you need a few of them, it's fine. And if this is the easiest way and cleanest way to do it, it's fine to use global variables. Um, another thing is, very, mo most of the code that you will write for research is going to be thrown away. You already know a priori that most of the things that you're going to try are not going to work. So there is no reason to code them super efficient and super clean at the first try. Like, it's usually a good idea to always try to prototype things first, maybe in Python or in MATLAB, and only when you are sure of what you want, you really commit to a good implementation. Or there is a very high risk that you're going to invest your time coding something that you're going to throw away uh, in the end. And then two more. So one is, that are related. So one is, don't use explicit pointers if you can. Like, there are very, very few cases where you really need them. And they are dangerous because you could have random crashes or random memory corruption. So like, if you really don't have to, just avoid them. Or maybe use them only at the end if, if you really care about performances. And another small thing is when you're working, it, it happens that you have some small bug somewhere that is corrupting memory and crashing your program. And maybe it's happening very rarely. Like if, you, if this happens, like if your program crashes at any point, you should just stop and figure out what the problem is. Because if you have a memory corruption somewhere, it's not going to get better as you add more and more code to it. It's only going to hide in there and then bite you two hours from the deadline when you try to generate something and it doesn't work. Right? So if there is something crashing, just stop, fix it until it's done. Don't move on with anything else. So I hope this will be uh, useful. And that's it from my side. I'm just passing uh, the stage to Alec. And while we Swap laptop if you have any question on these, I'll be happy to answer. Yes. So uh, the way the way they work is that they are designed to work together with NumPy, but uh, for performance reason we prefer to have the conversion explicit. So uh, we if you if you have there is a type that is a wrapper on over eigen. But you can use where well, you can use all the yes, functions uh, of Eigen. Yeah. yeah. And then there is a way to convert between um, between this Eigen wrapper and NumPy. And the conversion for dense matrices is free, like we are just sharing memory. But for sparse matrices, is not yet. All right. So I want to close up with uh, homework. Well, can really assign homework if I never see you again. Um, but for people that are interested in learning geometry processing, presumably people in the audience today, um, I teach a grad level course at the University of Toronto um, covering a variety of different geometry processing topics. And not surprisingly, as a developer of LibIGL, I've built my assignments for my course off of LibIGL. So I'd like to give you a little bit of the taste for the, the assignments that I've built um, and give them to you. They're open source. You can do these uh, at your leisure. And those of you that are instructors in the audience, you can consider these as possible assignments that you could give in your similar courses. Um, so I'm going to hop over to the web page for this. Um, so you can find this link. Um, I can, I'm going to throw it on the libIGL page too, um, but search for Alec Jacobson Geometry Processing uh, course. It's not showing up there. Let me end the show. Uh, here we go. All right. Um, so this is sort of the landing page for the course. There's not much here except for a note or two about dependencies and prerequisites in terms of what sort of uh, background I'm expecting students to have, basically linear algebra and uh, calculus, and the organization. So this is the, the order that I gave these assignments in my course, but um, really the introduction is only the one that you have to do first, and then you can mix and match uh, these different topics. So each of these uh, little things here is a link to a separate repository. So each assignment has its own repository. Actually, I wanted to do the parameterization one. Um, so this is a repository 
Um, when I'm teaching this class, I ask my students to fork this repository. They can then clone it onto their computer, work on their uh, version of the project, and then submit their uh, solutions as a pull request onto this repository. Um, and for instructors in the audience, I can point you to uh, the teacher copy that has the solutions and also some uh, best practices for dealing with pull requests and so on if you're interested. Um, but for the student copy, um, the way that I've organized each of these repositories are based on a topic. So this is the uh, assignment for parameterization. And there's a couple different things here. So there's a readme file um, that contains background information, the goals of the project, and uh, some figures and images that will help explain uh, what the topic is. So this is on the topic of parameterization. So there's some background on tut embedding. There's some references uh, to some classic works, some examples of uh, harmonic parameterization, and uh, eventually least squares conformal uh, parameterization that Daniele was showing. Now you'll see that the readme looks horrific with all this stuff, latex y looking stuff. And I wish GitHub would render MathJax. But the readme does not render in the GitHub page. But if you clone the repository and then just open up the HTML page, you get all the math. So OK, there's a little bit of work. Just clone it and open up the HTML page on your computer. And then it will work. So you get uh, math in here. So you can think of this as sort of the supplemental to a lecture that might be given on this. They're more or less standalone. So I think you could read through this and be well equipped to uh, actually do the assignment. So at the bottom of each of these readme files, uh, let's see, there are some tasks. And because these are fundamental uh, topics, there's already code in libigl that usually does this thing. So what's the value of an assignment if you could just go into libigl and say, OK, I call least squares conformal maps. There, I'm done. Um, so we have a blacklist. These are the functions you should not use. and you know, if you're honorable and all students are honorable, you don't even open them and, and stay clear of them. And then there's the whitelist. So these are functions that you should use. Like, don't waste your time uh, writing a sparse eigenvalue solver. Like, we have one of those. So, so just use that one. Or, um, yeah, this one, this one has an indication that you should use the, the cotangent Laplacian from libigl, because we already did that in a previous uh, assignment. Or you could use your previous implementation. And then there's three. CPP files that you as a student should fill in. So there's a tut embedding, a vector area matrix, and a least a squares conformal uh, uh, map function. And each of these corresponds to, where am I? A file inside of the source directory that those of you that are CS students are kind of used to this. There's a line, replace this with your code. So your, your task is now to actually write the contents of this function. And in the include directory, there's always a corresponding header file uh, that tells you what the input and expected output is uh, for that function. And I've set up these assignments like libigl in terms of this one function, one file paradigm function based. Uh, matrix APIs. Um, and I've separated each of the assignments into bite-sized chunks. So hopefully you can work on little pieces. Maybe if you get really stuck, borrow some high-level pieces from libigl so you can get one part working and then move on to, to fixing the part that you got stuck on. Um, so I think for this example, there are uh, three different pieces here. Um, when I teach the course, I assign one of these topics every week. So I have a weekly coding assignment uh, um, in my grad level course. And so like some rumbling about maybe a little bit too much work. But it's definitely something you can do uh, in a weekend, uh, if not one, one long afternoon. Um, let's see. So I want to give a little bit of a tour through the topics that we have. So I have uh, mesh reconstruction. Whoa, I didn't even know I could do that. I don't know how I did it. Huh. So I have, uh, in mesh reconstruction, we're implementing Poisson surface reconstruction, a classic example of turning a point cloud um, into a triangle mesh. In surface registration, we're doing iterative closest point uh, registration of two partial meshes using a rigid transformation. 
um, for smoothing, we're smoothing data on a surface and then also smoothing a surface itself. So uh, smoothing a field living on a, a static surface but also uh, smoothing the geometry like we saw in that uh, airplane at the very beginning of the course. Uh, parameterization I already talked about. Uh, deformation was probably, wow, I'm learning something. Right. Deformation is probably the most involved uh, one of the assignments that I have and here you're actually implementing two different types of mesh deformation techniques uh, for real-time mesh deformation. So the first one that you saw was the biharmonic deformation uh, that Daniele showed of like the weird guy's nose and uh, chin being moved. Um, and then and as rigid as possible deformation of this, uh, this character here. Um, I'm particularly proud of uh, how uh, the as rigid as possible technique can be distilled sort of into a pre-computation phase and an iterative uh, phase. So I, I hope that uh, students can find this useful. Um, and the last one is computing curvatures on a surface. So if we look here, um, we have examples of different ways of computing, uh, let's see, Gaussian curvature, mean curvature, and principal curvatures on a surface, um, and even computing, let's see, curvature, did one of the images in that load, let's see, let me open up the local one. Oh, I thought I had images. Sad. How dare I try to run the example? Let's see. Yeah, okay. I'll cheat. All right, so this is a cactus model. You can see one method of uh, computing Gaussian curvature. Another method of computing Gaussian curvature, we can plot uh, mean curvatures. We can, let's see, I can scale my color map. And the one thing I wanted to show was uh, showing the curvature directions. Uh, so in this assignment, you can compute uh, curvature values in a discrete manner uh, or compute them by locally fitting a quadratic function uh, via a very famous paper on uh, osculating jets. Okay, so that is my seven uh, course topics uh, based off of geometry, uh, libIGL and geometry processing. Um, I invite you to take a look at them. Like I said, uh, teachers in the audience, I'd love to get more people using this and possibly build this um, into a bigger collection of uh, geometry processing um, bite-size assignments. Um, and I'll also point to Daniele uh, has a, a complementary project that he's doing for his courses where he's um, placing sort of more high-level uh, tasks uh, to code things that aren't already in uh, libIGL. So sort of complement, I have short-term weekly assignments, Daniele has some uh, longer-term assignments, um, and he has a repository for those. So with that in mind, that more or less closes up the content that we have for the course. I'd like to uh, thank you all for your uh, attention during the course and I'll welcome any final questions. So if there are any final questions, I think David has some remarks. Yes. Yeah, so that's a question. Yeah, yeah. I was just saying, yeah. maybe you could say a little bit about, about the visualization mode. So obviously you have a bunch of things there. I was thinking maybe you also have reflection maps and sort of like a different scalar visualization mode and stuff like that. 
So the, the viewer that we have in libigl grew actually out of the tutorial that we wanted to write. So we, we needed a viewer to demonstrate all the things that we had. Most of the time before we wrote this viewer, we had our own little apps for each project where we're using all the libigl code, uh, but we didn't have a centralized way of, of showing that off. So we wrote a small viewer um, to do basic mesh visual visualization, um, but it became increasingly clear that actually having a sort of standard mesh viewer is a useful thing. Um, some things are uh, moving in that direction. That The goal of libigl is never to be like an application. So we're, we're trying to steer our trajectory in a different direction than say like, Mesh Lab or these other or uh, Open Flipper that have a uh, sort of an IDE or a GUI that contains everything. Um, it's fully open source in the sense that you can drill down and customize these things. So the shaders are there; you can you can edit them. Um, we've tried to make sort of uh, typical uh, data visualization on meshes exposed. Um, so just like pointing at this uh, figure of lots of different things here. Um, this example has a line field, so it's easy to add lines per vertex or per face, or even um, add them at arbitrary points. You can add scattered points. Um, I think it's now easier than ever to have uh, scalar data fields attached to vertices or faces. You don't even have to do the color map thing. You can just give it the data and it'll use a default color map. Um, maybe Daniele can talk a little bit yeah, more I mean, you know, about... I to say where the data is, so depending on the size of the data, you're going to get if you provide a vector that is as big as the faces, you're going to see the value on the faces. If you provide a vector that is as long as the vertices, you see it on the vertices. And there are a few features that we plan to add. We are going to have probably multiple mesh visualizations soon. And, but we're not really planning to invest a lot of resources in developing the viewer at this point. Yeah, don't count on like a full-fledged Maya-style mesh editing thing coming out but anytime we do, soon. We do have, we do have uh, the trackball of Maya. Yes, we have like, yeah. we have like, everybody is like very, uh, you know, has their specific trackball. So we do support the two most uh, popular trackballs. So um, if you're allergic to one, hopefully we have the other one. <laughs> Any other questions? Otherwise, let's also thank Elegant and Elegant.